Professor, I want to begin with the child you were. Uh, I'm arbitrarily at 10. Where are you living? Tell me a little bit about your family at that point. Well, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, with a couple of younger siblings. You're the eldest? Yes. Okay. And as a kid, I was very interested in astronomy and space. You perhaps realize that, or remember, that those that was the days of the space race. Yes. Everybody was interested in space. And it made me very interested in astronomy, but I can remember being worried that by the time I grew up, astronomers would have to live and work in space, which sounded dangerous. <laughs> so we, you were a cautious yes, astronomer. Well, yes, okay. but we noticed that hasn't happened. So space telescopes are extremely important. Both the astronomers who design and use them live safely on the ground. <laughs> now, I'm going to stay with that 10-year-old. Yes. Um, is he lucky enough to have had uh, to have a scientist in the family, or well, my he... father is a physicist? Yes, it's a physicist. Yes. Now, was he the kind of father, and your mother also would fall into this category of influencer, who were, pushed you or let you follow your own curiosity? Uh, well, I'd actually say that my parents avoided pushing me very much. Uh, they might have, if anything. Well, they went pretty far in that direction. Uh, my father did help me learn relatively advanced math at the age of about 11, but then nothing happened after that for years, which actually had the result of the fact that it was a long time before I realized that there was more interesting math than what I'd already learned. Huh. I, I'm still trying to characterize, perhaps inappropriately, yes. this child that you were as whether self-directed or framed in terms of expectations. I wasn't highly self-directed, nor was I, nor were that, that strong uh, push. Uh, one vignette I want to mention is that I was given a small telescope when I was about nine, okay, maybe 10 or 11. And one of the highlights was seeing the rings of Saturn. But I can remember as a child thinking it was hard to find Saturn, which is something I can't understand in hindsight, huh. because eventually, I helped our own children see Saturn through a small telescope. And I know it's tr whenever it's up in the sky, Saturn is one of the most trivial objects to find. So obviously I didn't learn very much about the sky at that huh. time. Were you called um, in your parents' eye the, the one who was most likely to succeed, or were you all given um, a solid education, expectations for your future? Oh, I think there were high expectations for all the kids. For? All the kids. And all, all the kids. Yes. Um, now I'm going to put you in school. Um, is it a good school? Let's say at this point it would be elementary. Uh, are you a good student, for example? Oh, I was a good student. But um, my interest in... The main thing to tell you about my teen years is that my interest in math and science stagnated for a few years. And I didn't really pick it up again until I was about 21. 21? Yeah. When I realized that I just didn't have the talent for other things. And I would do much better concentrating on math and physics. Wonderful. So there was the default decision, but not... So, okay, what were you not good at enough? Well, what were your interests is the real question. Well... Whatever I was in, whatever else I might have been interested in, I didn't have the talent for. Um, <clears throat> but was it so uh, was, cultural things? Was it uh, athletic? What, what, what were what were the passions? Well, I realized I wasn't going to be happy studying history, which I had majored in as an undergraduate. You majored in history. Yes, I wasn't going to be happy as a journalist. Anyway, there was yes. there was a variety of things that weren't going to work. I realized. Are and there so, and with my. Please. It was frankly clear that my greatest talent was for math and science, even though I had, for a few years, my interest had flagged. So at the age of about 21, I went back in that direction. I'm still not going to let you go to 21. I want, I want that younger fellow, before he's figured out his principal talents, um, are you, do you have any mentors, anybody noticing you in school and saying, well, you might look into this or that, or are you you're just pretty much going according to your own interests, instincts? I would not say there was much guidance in high school years, certainly. Not, not I, much I could have been studying math at a much more advanced level, but 
that didn't happen. And anyway, as I told you, um, I actually went through a number of years where I assumed that what I learned was representative of math. Huh. It seems a little funny in hindsight. If you don't come to math and science as your direction until 21, yes. that means you would have majored in something else in, 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 as an undergraduate. Yeah, I told you already. I majored in history. Right. Uh, it was, I thought it was in high school that you were no, no. oriented. It was in, uh, and what kind of history? Um, well, at Brandeis, we didn't have to specialize very much, so I didn't. Uh, so I took a variety of history courses. Not just honestly, American history no, or whatever, but no, a whole, a whole uh, range. Honestly, not too memorable in hindsight. You said earlier, in a way, you weren't good enough uh, in that, and you switched interests. No, I could have done okay in, in some other things. In fields that didn't require a lot of interpersonal relationships, I could have t probably done fine. But, um, but I realized I wasn't going to be satisfied. Now, 21 is very often the point at which one decides on graduate studies. Um, where I, I don't think you, you went, to, your first graduate study, I think were, it was in economics. That's correct. But I transferred after one year to applied math at Princeton. Right, but as an economist, the expectation was, um, were you, again, expecting a theoretical, there would have been some reason why you would have taken graduate studies in economics. Well, I suppose I would have told you at the time that I wanted to, to do something connected with development in third world countries. It's hard okay. to remember, honestly, but I think that's what I would have thought. I was just wondering whether it was a, a bit of a political decision about an engagement in the world or whether it was just... No, I just told you. I, I think I was interested in economic development in third world okay. countries. And which I think I would not have been good at, by the way. Well, fortunately, you, you chose another <laughs> path. Um, now, you decide against economics as graduate. You yes. don't then immediately go to graduate school uh, in... I was lucky enough to be able to get into Princeton in applied math. Immediately? Yes. Well, that suggests to me preparation. Uh, I had some preparation. It's hard to give an accurate description, but at Michigan, even as an economics student, I was able to take some math and physics courses. Okay. So and I had those recommendations. So when you entered graduate work in mathematics, oh, I'm sorry, possibly in physics? Oh, well, applied math at Princeton is a program rather than a department. Ah. But um, so people in the applied math programs get their degrees in different departments. It, it could have been math. But in my case, by the time I arrived at Princeton, I was leaning toward physics, which was certainly a common choice, I think, probably for students in the applied math program. Right. So you had applied in physics, you were in the physics department. Uh, well, I don't remember very well what the structure was, but I was originally admitted in applied math, and after a year I changed to the physics department. I see. Okay. But the applied math program was flexible enough that, regardless, I could have actually done a physics PhD without officially changing to the physics department, ah. because the, the structure of Princeton allowed that. It, it, it's the, a, there isn't an applied math department, as I just told you. I, People I, accepted I, in applied math, at least at that time, but I think even today, we're getting PhDs in a variety of departments. Right. This is one of the decision points of your life, obviously. There will yes. be many. Um, and Well, again, a crucial decision point was when I decided to do physics rather than math. Yes, and, I, and I'd uh, like to know why. Uh, well... <laughs> <laughs> the most significant statement to make is that it was based on very little knowledge of either field. Well, okay. <laughs> I, this is not so unusual. It wasn't a well-informed decision. <laughs> no, no, I understand that. But other of your colleagues have often said the same thing. So, it. But the, the decision. Yeah. What I'm, I think, in, in the interview with you, particularly interested in finding out. Yes. Is this habit of thinking of, it's more than a habit, but thinking of physics and mathematics as quite separate, whereas of course in the end in your career, yes. you would show the relationship. So at, at the point where you become a graduate student yes. here, um, the separation was considered quite dramatic. The separation was large enough so that when I was a graduate student, a graduate student in physics would not be exposed to any topics in modern mathematics. 
which, of course, in the 19th century would have been considered ridiculous. Yes. I mean, uh, something had happened. Yes. And I guess that's what I'm trying to track. Even the legend, and I, as far as I know, it's only a legend, that the reason why there was no mathematics Nobel Prize was because um, Nobel assumed that that would be incorporated into physics. Um, whether that's true or not, because there are also scurrilous stories about why there's no mathematics um, Nobel Prize. But still, by the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th yes. century, they would have been considered quite related subjects. Quite related, but not nearly as related as they'd been a century earlier. Uh, a century before that, the same people were mathematicians and physicists. Yes. Now, by 1900, uh, abstract math, as we know today, was developing in such a way that there were important branches of math that by then seemed far removed from physics. Uh, so, it, uh, compared to 1973 when I started graduate school, yes. the description of 1900 is correct. But even by then, uh, compared to a century earlier, there was a lot of abstract math that was pretty far removed from physics. I, just to give one example, I don't remember what number there is developed class field theory, but it was roughly that time, and nobody working on that thought it had anything to do with physics. To this, and well, even today, it's only connected exactly to, physics. to this. Only even today, it's only connected to physics by a very long and roundabout route. So you chose physics. Yes, but I should tell you. Okay, I told you that that was based on very little knowledge of either field. But it was based on the excitement about the elementary particles that existed at that time because of a whole string of amazing discoveries that were made experimentally mm -hmm. in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. So I'm going to put it this way, please correct me. You were lucky in your moment to, I mean, in the, in the intellectual currents at that time. Well, it's worked out fine for me. We don't know what would have happened if I'd made the other decision. Right. That might have worked out fine, too. So you chose physics yes. as the formal framework. Yes. And so I got an education, like other physics graduate students of the time, that included very little exposure to any mathematics done in the last half century. Right. Because it wasn't considered necessary. Right. Um, so how do you... How does either your curiosity take you back to well, mathematics or... Well, you see, the other thing that happened... I was attracted to um, to physics because of the romance of the elementary particles. But that subject was radically changing just at this time because the last major ingredient of the standard model of particle physics was actually discovered just a few months before I started graduate school. That was the discovery of asymptotic freedom by Gross, Wilczek, and Pulitzer, huh. for which they won the Nobel Prize in about 2004. So... Um, well, it took a while to, to fully appreciate the consequences. So, experiment had been way ahead of theory for a couple of decades. Yes. But by the time I was starting graduate school, theory was catching up. And in catching up, in developing the standard model, physics was put on new foundations, which involved a lot of mathematical questions yes. that hadn't been relevant before. This wasn't realized all at once. It came to be realized in a long process that kind of started in the mid-70s and I think took at least a decade in my eyes before we really understood the implications. I suppose I'm now going to be probing a little bit into your personality in the face yes. of these options. Yes. Are, are you pursuing your own interest in spite of directions given you by your professors? No, are, no, you, no, no. are you finding professors who... Uh, as, who well, are good all, for the moment? Well, first of all, my, my graduate advisor was one of the discoverers of asymptotic freedom, okay. David Gross. And his student, Frank Wolchek, uh, was still in the department, I guess as an assistant professor when I was a graduate student. Wolchek was his co-discoverer. So anyway, I was definitely uh, completely within the mainstream of physicists okay. working on the standard model. And my thesis consisted of some yes. interesting but relatively minor, I mean, detailed applications of the standard model. The most interesting part of my thesis was that I worked out the standard model prediction for what's called deep inelastic photon-photon scattering, which wasn't really experimentally measurable at the time, but eventually was measured. Huh. And the prediction is interesting. Uh, 
Um, the prediction is interesting because, first of all, you can calculate it in the standard model, but, but it really doesn't give the obvious answer. Uh, I thought of that project. Okay, in those days before the internet, journals, of course, were the traditional method of yes. communication, but they were slow. Yes. By the 1970s or mid 70s, when I was a student, physicists were communicating by paper preprints. You'd write a paper and send out paper copies to a few hundred colleagues who would read it long before it appeared in a journal. So the department had piles of paper preprints. And I would sometimes just sit down literally with a stack of paper preprints and leaf through them. And eventually I got to a paper where a colleague had tried to work out the standard model prediction for this process, but it wasn't too hard to see it hadn't been done correctly. And that doing it correctly was interesting. That was the most interesting part of my thesis. But it was far from revolutionary. It was an interesting and not trivial. It was sufficient. But not incredibly deep contribution to the standard model. So the discovery was the discoveries were not so great, but the promise was clearly there because you then got a position as a result of your of your work. At Harvard, as a postdoctoral fellow. As a postdoctoral fellow. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, again, something about the almost the sociology of, of your science. Is the collegiality of the inquiry important to you? Or are you pretty much relatively isolated in the way you're pursuing problems? Uh, well, when I was young, I was more collegial than I am now. And I tend to think I lose something as a result. Um, well, we'd have to skip a few decades to explain that. but. Um, maybe we should stick with the period where we were discussing. At the time, I was highly interactive, I would say. What was your postdoc direction? So, was, as a student in initial postdoc years, I was obsessed with the problem of trying to understand better what's called the strong interactions, which describes the nuclear force that holds together the atomic nucleus. So, the breakthrough of asymptotic freedom that I mentioned to you earlier yes. had enabled physicists to understand that the nuclear force is described by a theory that we call quantum chromodynamics. It's a non-abelian gauge theory with the gauge group SU3. Yes. So by the time I was a student, we knew what the equations were, but we didn't know how to solve them. And, um, well, that's actually a conundrum even today. So I'd say that the understanding of the strong interactions even today is not what one would wish. But at the time, I was obsessed with the problem. Mm -hmm. The fact that 40 years later, the problem is still largely unsolved puts a perspective on the fact yes. that I was having trouble at the time. So gradually, I had to uh, work on more modest problems that I could actually do. And so I got some experience in working on what's called non-perturbative questions in quantum field theory. So uh, during the years I was at Harvard, I learned a lot from all the professors there in theoretical particle physics. But of them, only one was interested in these non-perturbative questions. That was Sidney Coleman. So I learned a lot from him. And he also introduced me to some of the math papers that eventually were important for me. Oh. Anyway, OK. Is, is, is this increasing use of interest in mathematics seeming less and less odd for a physicist? I mean, you're, you're at a time where, where well, the... Well, it came to seem less odd, but the process took at least a decade, starting roughly, well, starting in the mid-70s, really. So gradually, physicists learned that they could do interesting... Well, first of all, that the standard model was hard to understand. And trying to understand non-abelian gauge theories at the quantum level led to mathematical questions right. that physicists hadn't been interested in before. It also attracted the interest of mathematicians. Um, Can you speak a little more about that? Because mathematics was feeling very much separate from physics well, in general. Yes. Well, the, the, there are primarily two reasons that mathematics was so separate from physics. Yes. One is that in the 20th century, mathematics had developed in rather abstract directions. The second is that the most, after the development of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, so non-relativistic quantum mechanics emerged in the 20s, 
it did have a big mathematical influence in the development of functional analysis, for example. But the biggest challenge in physics after that was the development of what became quantum field theory yes. and ultimately the standard model. And that was very difficult mathematically. The foundations are difficult to understand mathematically. They're not very well understood mathematically even today. And the considerations of physicists working on it and what they were grappling with was rather far afield from the interests of most mathematicians. So uh, this is a cartoon version that omits a lot of things, but very roughly in the half century up to when I was a graduate student, mm -hmm. the preoccupations of physics and math were in rather different directions. But non-abelian gauge theory, which was the bread and butter of the standard model, was interesting to a lot of mathematicians. And people like Isinger, Michael T. or Walbott, David Kajan and others, who either were in the Cambridge area when I was a postdoc at Harvard or else in Atiyah's case were visiting there sometimes. They were very interested in these developments, became convinced that they'd be significant mathematically, also made an effort to educate me and other physicists. In, in the about reading I've done yes. about your career, I yes. still detect, this is an impression, yes. um, a sort of surprise that theorems in mathematics came from your work in physics. They, they still seem stunned. They, they don't doubt it anymore, Yes, but they still seem surprised. Well, I was surprised, of course, too. And when right. it happened at first, it seemed like an exception. So there was a summer school in Carjaz in 1979 where Atiyah and Bott yes. had taken it upon themselves to educate physicists about something called Morse theory, which I'm sure none of us had ever heard of, certainly I had not. And I didn't think about it again for a couple of years. But then around 1981 and 82, I was trying to understand something in physics called spontaneous breaking of supersymmetry. And I could see it was obstructed in a way I didn't understand. A lot of models you'd think would spontaneously break supersymmetry did not. And trying to understand it, I kept looking at simpler and simpler models, and they all kept doing the same thing. Finally, I got it down to the very simplest model that just involved a function with a, sorry, that just involved a manifold with a function on it, which physically was the superpotential. And it still had the same strange behavior. Huh. At a certain point, I dimly remembered what Bod and Atiyah had lectured to us about in Carjas, and I realized what I was stumbling onto was Morse theory. So that resulted in my paper called Supersymmetry and Morse Theory. For physicists, I explained the difficulty of supersymmetry breaking. For mathematicians, I gave a new interpretation of Morse Theory. I think the paper in the long run has been more influential for, for math than for physics. In terms of communication yes. across the fields, yes. um, is the habit forming, if that's the way to describe it, of mathematicians reading more of the kind of work you were doing in physics and uh, people in physics looking more in mathematics? I mean, for categories that had been separated and isolated, yes. I wonder about the communication of ideas in, in, in this way. How one field begins to learn from the other in a very active way. Well. I'm not sure how to answer in the abstract. In the concrete case of math and physics during my career, uh, it took, I was not very quick in perceiving a pattern. Uh, these things happened, but they all seemed kind of isolated. Right. In part because, okay, uh, in these years, uh, until the mid-80s, let's say, my focus was really on understanding the standard model better. Yeah. and other things seemed like digressions. And, well, as I I've already told you, the problems I was most interested in are still largely unsolved today. What fascinated me most was to get a better understanding of core confinement. And although I was eventually able to make some minor contributions there, the fact is it's not understood even today in a way I consider satisfactory. So, the... Mathematical spin-offs coming from physics and the applications of math to physics were interesting, but they didn't seem to penetrate to the core of what I really wanted to do. Mm. So that's a quick summary of my attitude in the, let's say, the early 80s. The main reason that changed was that 
string theory emerged as a framework for going beyond quantum field theory and unifying gravity with the other forces. And when it became clear, which was the case by 1984, that string theory was a very serious candidate and framework for trying to do that, the perspective of physicists widened a lot, and the opportunities for interacting with math and the importance of doing so became much greater. Hmm. Now, I'm also uh, quite interested in just the structure of your career, not just the yes. problems you're addressing, yes. but your decision as to where to go. Um, you are certainly invited to be a member of faculties. Um, how are you making your decisions? This is just the practicality well, of life. I didn't make too many decisions because I've been at the Institute here since 1987. Yes. So you pretty much, yes. it was a natural process as to where you were. Yes, well, we came to Princeton originally to the Princeton University yes. in 1980. Yes. And the only change I made since then was moving to the Institute. To the Institute. Although I was on sabbatical at Caltech and considered moving there at one point. Or when you've got young children, um, Princeton is life in Princeton is comparatively simple. So once we were settled in Princeton, there weren't a lot of places we were tempted yes, to go so to this for was, a long time. It was comfortable to stay here, and of yes. course, intellectually challenging. Yes. Um, I spoke to some of mathematicians, Birsar Yvette, at the yes. Institute there, and I asked the question I'm about to ask you, um, and it comes really from ignorance as the process. I asked whether uh, a disadvantage of these marvelous places was the absence of students, uh, that you, you really are left relatively alone or entirely alone if you choose. Tell me about, about that, the, uh, well, either the absence or whether you in fact had, well, I had uh, students. Well, throughout all these years, I did have students actually. You did? Because professors here take graduate students from Princeton. So I wasn't teaching courses, ah. but I almost always had one or two graduate students, occasionally three. Right now I only have one, and she's about to finish. Um, is, there, is there a particular thing to be said, or maybe nothing, um, that interests you about this, about the intellectual interchange that happens in teaching that affects the kind of work one does? Well, it's it certainly surprising. affects their work. But uh, it's a little bit surprising that you often think of things better when you're trying to explain something to somebody else. Okay. Um, well, I should point out to you, though, that there's a very large group of postdoctoral fellows here at the Institute. So they're not graduate students. They've got their PhD. Right. So they're just past that stage. But interacting with them is not that different from interacting with students. So that should be part of the answer to your question. And do they, do they I mean, the explanation I get but do they stretch the range of questions you're asking yourself, or is that something that pretty much... Sometimes. In the last couple of years, I've been working on and off with one of them, who unfortunately has just left. Huh. So it's not inevitable, but yes. it can happen. Yes. Well, we're still working together, but now that he's at Stanford, uh, Stanford we'll finish this project, but it'll be harder to start a new one uh, long distance. But maybe I'll start working with one of the other young people. We'll see. It's obvious to ask you about getting the field medal. It, it's, it was considered and is still considered unusual for somebody yes. principally defined as a physicist to get yes. it. You, I think, have been the only one uh, physicist, yes. primarily a physicist, who, who achieved it. Um, so. Uh, were you as surprised as... Uh, well, I certainly was quite surprised. Yes, definitely. What What was mostly said about the reason, because they would have to explain that to the mathematical community as well, this this kind of a selection. Um, do you remember specifically what was cited? Well, of course you must remember, but well, does it interest you to tell me what you were cited for? Well, that There was no official citation in those days. Ah. But... Michael Tia, it was traditional that somebody would give a lecture about the work of the recipients. However, in my case, an explanation was written by Michael Tia and actually delivered by yes. Ludwig Fadeev. And if you're curious, there's a written version in the proceedings of the conference, so you can read about it. Um, he addresses the surprise of it, so to speak, 
while explaining the contribution? Probably, I don't remember it that, that vividly. But I think I saw a little bit of that in it. But again, that's not important. What's yes. important is the, the, uh, the sense of what you had contributed. And in a way, maybe this is not the best way to describe it, based on the work you had done, yes. mathematicians had to take account of it in the, the framing of, of problems. Well, it's hard for me to comment on this, to be okay, honest with you. Okay, fair enough. Um, I was surprised when I was awarded the Fields Medal. But I'm actually a little bit more comfortable in hindsight than it was at the time, because I feel that regardless of my work up till 1990, I made some further contributions after that. Right. So you see the implications of that work right now in the work of others, presumably. Hopefully. <laughs> um, again, it's a very general question, which uh, you can answer as you want. And that is that almost in layman's terms, it seems like you're among the few looking for um, a single theory of the universe. May, I, I'm sure you have various views of whether that's even possible, but you are that expansive in some of the questions you're asking. Is that fair to say? Well, sort of. But what I'd really like to stress for you yes. is that I would not have gone looking for a unified theory of gravity and quantum mechanics, yes. because I would have had no idea where to start. And uh, so if string theory hadn't existed, I mean, not only I don't think I would have invented it, but I wouldn't have tried to invent it, again, because of not having right. any idea where to look. But string theory was discovered. It's kind of artificial to ignore the fact that humans stumbled upon a framework that does go beyond conventional quantum field theory and forces us to include gravity while conventional quantum field theory makes gravity impossible. Yes, yes, yes. And since that came to be appreciated, which was in the mid-80s, there's been a large community of people working in that direction. So it's a bit misleading to characterize me as one of the few or one of the only ones. But what is true is that we're all working in a framework that we don't really understand. Uh, so, uh, I see string theory as this vast ocean of knowledge, which has led to an incredible series of surprises, okay. which are about us in all directions, where we're far from coming to grips with the most fundamental truths of the subject, whatever they are. It's often asked, um, perhaps there's no easy answer to this, but since your audience is mostly young mathematicians and, yes. and scientists, um, what particularly excites you, maybe an extension of what you just said, but what particularly excites you in the work now and in the direction um, that mathematics and physics are going? Well, I'm going to amplify what I've already said. Please. So, one of the main reasons that physics made so much progress in the 20th century yes. is that the framework in which physicists were working is highly constraining. So, for example, when the part of the standard model that describes the weak interactions was discovered by uh, Weinberg, Glashow, and Salam, they actually had extremely meager experimental clues. But they were able to get a long way with very meager experimental clues because they tried to fit it into the framework of relativistic field theory. Yes. Yes. And that framework is extremely restrictive. So the framework of relativistic quantum field theory was a kind of force multiplier, and they were able to find the right theory with what would seem like ludicrously limited experimental clues. So it's a very rich framework, and part of the richness is that it's almost impossible to change it in any way without getting into some kind of contradiction. Yes. Rather immediate contradictions. I think that this is one of the most important observations about 20th century physics and something that very few people outside the field appreciate. It's extremely hard to appreciate it, I think. Unless you've really learned quantum field theory, it would be virtually impossible to understand what I mean in saying that it's a very restrictive framework. It's very hard to change it. And its power is one of the main reasons that the standard model was discovered based on limited experimental data. Right. Now, precisely because it's virtually impossible to tamper with the standard 
that the standard framework of relativistic quantum field theory without getting into contradictions. One has to take extremely seriously any way of tampering with it that does present itself. Yes. And the only interesting modification of relativistic quantum field theory that's been discovered that makes any sense is string theory. And that alone would make it extremely exciting to study. But the fact that it forces gravity upon us, yes. while in the standard framework we can't really have quantum gravity, apparently, this isn't to save it with the precision of the mathematical theorem, um, well, makes it extremely compelling to study. And then plus the fact that in studying it, one has uncovered so many surprises, both where one gets a better understanding of existing physical theories, and sometimes new insights in pure math have popped out. Right. So I think there's something very deep there, and it's very exciting to try to understand it better. So, Where would you send a young person uh, to a mathematics department, to a physics department? Well, see, I think if you want to grapple with the questions I was just raising, Yes, exactly. Physics. That's what I'm asking. If right. you want to grapple with physics, you're really going to have to start with a physics education. I see. And then try to branch out into math. But math, obviously, is great for the people it's great for. <laughs> but in uh, the end, there's a conceivable convergence. It's just the framework in which you, you begin that journey, that intellectual journey. Well, I'd say that... Um, there are a lot of times that concrete mathematical ideas are suggested by string theory. And mathematicians appreciate those and put them into their own theories, often formulate things differently, come up with different proofs or different yes. ways of looking at things. Yes. But the conundrum in physics that's behind it all is actually extremely difficult to explain in mathematical language. Maybe the day will come when it can be explained in mathematical uh -huh. language. But that's not the case as of 2019. So, uh, take the statement, relativistic quantum field theory apparently makes it impossible to have gravity, yes. while string theory forces us to include gravity. And the second statement, but the fundamentals of string theory are completely unclear. Now, it's virtually impossible to explain either of those two statements uh. to a mathematician, uh. while those two statements are the essence of what my physics colleagues and I grapple with. Yes. So, again, uh, this is too simple a way of asking, but at this point, yes. were you entering the discourse? Yes. Um, still, you might take the, phys the, the, the path of the, of the physicists in terms of um, the problems that interest you. Sorry, I Coming to mathematics, I, I, as I say, it may be just too simple to ask, uh, but it's back to this question of a choice for somebody who wants the larger picture. Yes. Um, it's the physics or mathematics. It's really the, it seems like in physics, um, as you were speaking of it, it's more uh, graspable as a path to get to this convergence. Well. I've got no idea how close or far we are from this convergence or from answering the really deep questions about string theory and or quantum gravity. I, I, I can't say. It, uh, it, I, I, all I can say is that, at least superficially, if in 2019 you want to understand the two sentences I stated, yes. which I view as the central mysteries that most baffle me, yes. the way to get to understand the questions, although not the answers, involved starting out as a physics student. I understand. Thank you very much.